Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Mathematical and Computational Thinking Level 4, Computational Representations. A computational representation is best understood as a model that's built on a mathematical model, and the simplest example of a computational model is a spreadsheet. So we're going to be building some spreadsheets and then using those spreadsheets to make predictions in this mini lesson. You always want to start when you're building a computational model with a mathematical model that it's built upon and even before that we have to have a phenomena that we're better understanding. Once you dig into the numbers and the data you can eventually create a computational model and that model becomes a simulation when you add a graph to it. And so when you're building a model it's really important as you develop the model that there is a core phenomena that you're better trying to understand by developing this computational model. Just like a graph the two parts of a model are going to be the components of the model and then the relationships of the model. It's interactive however so you can build input so I can input values into my computational model and then the computational power allows me to create some outputs that I can look at to better understand the phenomena itself. So after watching this video you should be able to build computational models and simulations for something like the supply and demand curve or energy conversion if we're looking at a sphere rolling down a plane. I'm going to start by just building some simple models around these uh, wooden cubes and then you'll have a chance to do the same as you look at these uh, little simulation of studying the sliders. And so let me clean this up and we'll get started. Okay, so let's say that I'm investigating these cubes. We have these wooden cubes and you can think of these as some wooden cubes that I understand, but there might be some random cubes that I want to better understand. So what I'm trying to do is build a computational model on this. And so there's values that I could gather on these. For example, I could, value, I could gather the value of maybe the length of the cube. So I could do that by measuring it. Um, or I could put it on a scale and I could see what its mass is. And so I'm not going to do that in the video, but let's just show you some data that I gathered on these three cubes. And so what I've got for data is I've got these three cubes. I've got the cube one, two, and three. This is the smallest one. It's got a length of 1.3 centimeters and it's got a mass of 1.5 grams. And then this one has a, a cube length of 1.9 and this one has a 3.7. And so lots of times you'll start when you're building a model around some data. You either have a graph or you have some data set that I'm going to build it on. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to build a computational model on this, in other words a spreadsheet that I can use to make predictions. So if I find any wooden cube, for example, I could figure out maybe what its volume is, surface area, and make a guess as to what its uh, mass might be. And so let me get these out of the way and I'll show you how I might do that. So the first thing you want to figure out is what are all the components that I might want to include into my model. And those are probably listed right here at the top. So I've got the cube length that I could measure with a ruler. I could calculate some of these other values as well. And let's say I don't want to mass every cube. I just want to have the model figure that out. So the first thing I identify in my model is what are all the components within my model. Let me write those out. So let's see these are the components that I want to include in my computational model. Cube length seems like the easiest one to measure. I could just measure one side of it and then maybe I could have it output all these other values. So I could say this is my input into the model and it sure would be nice if then everything else could just be output into the model and could be calculated for me. And so for me to do that what I have to figure out is what is the relationship of this to the cube length or what is the relationship of this to the cube length or even this to the cube length. And so we have to start building all those relationships into my model. And so the cube length is easy. That's just going to be my input. But if I'm trying to figure out what the surface area of a cube is, I really have to know how to calculate the surface area of a cube. And so I know that to do that, since you have a length, I just take the length times the width so it's essentially the length squared and then that's one area but there are six sides of a cube. And so let me write out an expression that would tell me the surface area of the cube.
Okay, so the expression that I've written is that the, the surface area of the cube is equal to six times the cube length raised to the power of two. In other words, the cube length squared. Uh, now, as we're looking at the volume, let me show you what I would write for an expression of that. So for the volume, I, once I find the psi, then I could fit, calculate the whole thing for this because it's just length times length times length. And so it's going to be cube length raised to the power of three. And then for the last one, the mass of the cube, let me show you how I would do that. Okay, so for the volume, I'm doing cube length to the, to the third, but now for mass of the cube, I could take the volume, so I could take this value, and then just take it times the density of wood. Now, how did I calculate the density of the wood? I'm just do, using that from the values that I have. So I just went through and found all the volumes and found the mass was about 0.65 of the volume. So you can see that I'm using data that I've collected to help me build a more accurate model. And so now that I have all my relationships figured out, now I just have to build that in the spreadsheet. So let me slide this to the side and we'll bring our spreadsheet out. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna enter my input length in this first column. So I'm just gonna type that in at the top. And then I could put the other values across the top as well. And then I can make those my headings across the top. And then what I can put in here is I could put in different values. And so I could say, let's start with zero, and then we could maybe make this 0.5. And I could just fill this down so it figures out, here's for a bunch of other cubes. So I've got a bunch of cube lengths like that. And now I have to figure out what the surface area is. So for me to figure out what the surface area is, now I look at my relationship here. So the surface area is equal to six times the cube length raised to the power of two. And so how do I take this and put it into a spreadsheet? Well, I'm just selecting this first cell and I'm just gonna hit the equals. And now it gives you a little formula that you can type into. And so I want that to be six. So I'm taking six times so I'm reading across here. Now I have to find my cube length. So how do I click on the cube length? I'm just gonna select the cell to the left and you can see that it puts in B2. So that is column B row two. And then what's the last thing I have to do? I have to raise it to the power of two. And so what it'll do is it'll not only calculate that value but it'll suggest that it calculates all the other surface areas going down. And so I can see the surface areas here. You can see they have different um, different accuracy or different point values. And so I could kind of adjust that so I get similar um, decimal values to the input that I have. And now I could go to the volume. So volume is going to be simple. I just hit equals. And now I'm gonna take this cube length raised to the power of three. And I can fill it out like that. Again, I could adjust it. So I'm gonna get the decimal points in the right spot. Let's go like that. Now we have to get to the mass. So again, what do I do? Again, I'm using my expression here. So it's gonna be equal to the volume of the cube. So I'm gonna hit equals. And now I'm gonna hit the volume. So I'm gonna select that. And now we're gonna take that times 0.65. And so now it's suggesting to fill all those in as well. And I could tidy this up so that it looks nice as far as point values go, decimal values rather. So there we go. So now I've got a computational model. If I could change any of these values, maybe I put this one and I want that to be nine, you can see it calculates all the other values like that. And so this is a computational model. What makes it a computational model? It's because there's math behind the model that we have. It's not a simulation yet. For it to be a simulation, then I have to graphically represent that. And that'd be easy to do as well. I could just select all of this and insert a chart and now I've got some values that I could look at. So I could look at what happens as the cube length increases, what happens to the surface area, what happens to the volume, and then what happens to the mass. What's also nice about this is I could take some new value. So let's say I've got this cube right here, and if I were to enter into a value of what the length is, so if I were to say, let me measure the length of this, 
So that's a length of 2.6. I could put that into my model. And it's going to tell me not only what is the surface area, what is the volume, but it's also going to tell me that the mass is going to be around 11 grams. And I could get a scale out and we could see how accurate that actually is. And so I get a value that's close to 10. It's not exactly 11.4, but again, it's a computational model. It's not always going to be perfect. So that's how you create a computational model. Remember, the first thing you do is identify all the components, find how they're related, and as they're related, we're going to find equations for each of those. And then we have the computational power kick out the output. So again, input is what you put into the spreadsheet, and the output is what the spreadsheet's going to do for you. And just think how long it would take for you to do all of those calculations by hand, and that's kind of the power of a computational model. So what I'm going to do is clean this up, and then I'm going to give you one that you could try as well. Okay, for the next phenomena, what we're using is study the sl sliders, which is just a little computer program that I wrote. And so you can pull, for example, the red to the left and the green will move to the right. So you can play around with each of these sliders and then the other ones will move. And so what I'm going to do is just reset that. And the idea is that you will create a computational model that explains study the sliders, where you can input something like the red slider, and then you can get the values of the other two. So first thing I want to do is, is define the phenomena. Okay, so what I'd love to have you do is just pause the video, then go through, play with study the sliders. I'll put a link down below, and so you can play with it. After you've done that, identify what are the major components that you want to include in your model, then find the relationship between all those components. Again, you'll have to use some little bit of algebra to figure that out, and then throw it in a spreadsheet. I'll put a link to a template down below so you can play with the spreadsheet and create a computational model. And if you can get your model to match with the, the app, then you're doing a good job. And so let me pause the video and then go give it a try. Okay, so the first thing I would do is I would probably play around with it. So I would set some different values. So maybe I would look at, if I move the red down to like negative eight, what am I getting for the green? I'm getting eight and negative four. Or if I move it to negative five, what am I getting? I'm getting a five and a negative two. So I would play around with just values. And, and when you do that, you can start to see some relationships. There's the gen generic relationships, like as I move red to the left, green goes in the opposite direction. Blue moves in the same direction as red, but not as fast as red. But you really want to get some numbers. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to write down, what are the important com components that I want to include in my model? So let me do that. So the components that I want to include are the red value, the green value, and the blue value. Just not where they are, but what the actual number is or the value. And the next thing I want to do is, let me get this out of the way, I have to write the relationships for these before I can ever write any kind of a spreadsheet. So in my model, I'm just going to have the input be the red value. And now I have to figure out, okay, if I've got a red value of, for example, negative 8, how do I calculate the other values? And let me do that. All right, this here. So I noticed when I input a value, the green is almost the inverse of that. So I'm just taking negative one times the red value. So if I have negative eight times negative one, it's eight, and that should kick out the correct green value. And then let me do the blue value. So I think the blue value is equal to half the red value. It's not the inverse, it's it's moving in the same direction, but it's about half. In other words, when this is negative eight, then this is going to be negative four. And so now that I have the components and the relationships, now I'm able to create a spreadsheet. So let me do that. When you're creating a spreadsheet, your components just become the headings uh, in, your just in your different columns. And then I can put some values in, so some red values. So I know it starts at negative, so red can go all the way down to negative 10 and up to 10. 
So I would probably want to put that as what my values are, negative 10. I could put negative 9 here, and then it can calculate the other ones for me. There we go. Now I have to put my green value in. So green value is equal to negative 1 times, then I'm going to click on my red value and then it'll fill those out for me. And then if I go to blue value, that's equal to, according to my equation, 0.5 times my red value. And it figures those out for me as well. Now I can already see some things that are wrong with my simulation. So I never, on the study the sliders, I never get decimal values. And so I could play around with this decimal. Oops, I want to select all of those. And I could play around with place value to figure out if I get a number that's that. And then I could see how this fits with the simulation and it fits with the data itself. So as I'm looking at the study the sliders data, I could just see how well this kind of matches up. So when I go to negative eight, it should be eight and negative four. When I go to negative five, it should be five and negative three. But you can see here what it actually kicks out is a negative two. And so lots of times what you get in your computational model is not gonna match what you get in the real world. And that means that your computational model is just wrong. And so ways that we could probably play around with that, if I were to go back to this equation, is I could try rounding it up. So you could maybe, there's all kinds of different things that you can add into your values. Oops, <laughs> equals round up. And that would be 0.5 times my red value. And then you could see, is that going to still work or not? And so I'm just rounding it in a different way. So now I've got negative five, I got five, and I have negative three. And again, that's not working. So I'd have to go back and maybe I have to round down or maybe I just have to round the value. And so the key thing as you're building a computational model is you're approximating what you would get in the, in the real world. Now, the next thing to make that a simulation, of course, is we have to make it a graph. So we have to have some kind of a graph that represents that data. And now this becomes a simulation where I can change different values and I can see what happens. And so that's just going from a phenomena to the components, to a computational model, and then to some kind of a simulation. Now that I've done this, you could do it on something like supply and demand, or you could try some energy conversions in uh, physics. It makes a lot of your calculations much quicker. But that's computational thinking. It's level four, and I hope that's helpful.